Africa Film for Impact Festival. Thank you everybody who got up early in Abuja and in other West African places to join us and a huge thank you to our panelists from three different continents this morning. Um, I'm welcoming you to the, okay, I'm having a bit of a screen sharing issue here. How's that? Is that better? Perfect. <laughs> okay, so this morning we're we're doing session three of the UCT Doc Impact Sessions with Afif. Um, we're very excited to be a part of this festival and we hope to grow the relationship and grow the interest and development of impact on the African continent. Today, we're gonna to be looking at three case studies um, from, th from three different continents. Yesterday, we focused on the African continent. Today, we are welcoming uh, Kush Puranka from India, and she's going to be talking about her film, An Insignificant Man. Alison Byrne Fields from the USA, who's going to be talking about Welcome to Chechnya. So in, effa in, in effect, actually representing two continents there, because Alison's from the USA and uh, Chechnya being, of course, in Eastern Europe. And Holly Pfeiffer from Australia talking about the opposition. Um, <clears throat> I just want to stop my, my screen share. Um, I'm going to just give a little bit of an intro of each of our panelists and then ask them to introduce themselves. We want to keep this discussion very um, informative but also interactive and we want to encourage you to post your questions in the chat as we go along and also keep an eye out for, for resources that Liani and Takira will be, will be sharing there. So, a little bit more about Alison Byrne Fields. Alison began her career at a small nonprofit that worked with young people to produce their own media. She was the creative director of Rock the Vote, and she ran campaigns to convince young people in the, in the United States that political participation wasn't a waste of time. Right now, we all know how important that work was. So <laughs> keep going, Alison, we're all behind you. Um, in 2011, Alison launched Aggregate, a creative strategy group that works with progressive nonprofits and foundations, as well as authors, authors filmmakers, um, and creating work with, with, a, with a view to social and political policy change. Um, today, she's gonna to be talking about her work with da on David France's film, Welcome to Chechnya. Alison, would you like to just jump in and say a, a, a hello and anything you'd like to share about yourself? Sure, I am uh, speaking to you from Seattle, Washington, which is on the West Coast. Uh, it's as soon as this is over, I will be going to bed. Um, so thank you all for your, uh, um, my, my, you will be in my dreams. Um, and uh, um, we're here in the United States where um, no one slept for the past few days. So um, uh, hopefully tomorrow there'll be some good news here, but that's pretty much top most of my mind right now. So that's what's going on. We're all certainly holding thumbs. And I don't know if you noticed, but when I introduced your name on the little uh, sign just before this, I chose blue for, for your name. I just thought, <laughs> you're not going to make new red today. So okay. <laughs> there was a little bit of subliminal messaging there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for staying up, Alison. Much appreciated. Um, oh, gosh, my computer's just frozen. Can you all still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. I'm just, um, my talking notes is frozen, so I'm going to have to busk it from here, folks. Um, moving on to Kushpu Ranka. Kushpu's first feature documentary, An Insignificant Man, is no stranger to impact accolades. Um, they've been awarded the Doc Society Impact Award, and they've brought about massive change in India as young emerging filmmakers, quite remarkable. Kushbu, would you like to say something about yourself this morning? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm talking to you from Bombay, and um, it's really nice to have so many uh, people from another, from a continent away, listening to a story that was like so close to us and resonated, and hopefully will continue to resonate. With um, uh, with people 
uh, around the world. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, next up, Holly Pfeiffer. Holly, could you just check your mute button or can the technical department ensure that Molly, Holly is unmuted? Holly is here from Melbourne this morning. Um, she's going to be talking about a film, The Opposition, which, which we brought into this panel. So all three projects here today have a very different impact story to tell. Alison's project is very much happening right now. Welcome to Chechnya, launched at the earlier this year. Um, Kushba's film, very strong political work being done there, as with the opposition. But with the opposition, there was also a very strong legal, legal impact case to be fought. So Holly, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, it's lovely to be here with you all and see all your gorgeous faces. Um, I'm talking to you from Melbourne, Australia, which is uh, stolen land. So I would just like to acknowledge the Wandere Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and uh, um, basically, yeah, just say thank you so much for having me. And I hope you get something out of the short presentation that I'm gonna be doing about the opposition. Um, it's great to be here with you all. Okay, so this morning we're going to start off by um, introducing all three projects and then we're going to launch into the body of the work. Um, starting off with welcome to Chechnya. Alison, could you introduce the project mm -hmm. and then we'll ask Michael to play the trailer. Sure. So uh, in April of 2017, there were independent media reports that um, that the, there were che uh, Chechen government um, security officials who were um, abducting, detaining, and torturing gay men. They had um, started. Uh, they had uh, in a it, they, in a um, uh, in a raid. They had seized someone's telephone, um, and on that telephone there was information uh, where uh, like a social network, people talking to each other, and there was it was clear that the men were communicating were were gay, um, and so they were essentially like getting people to name each other, and and that's how they were d determining who they were going to abduct and detain um, and torture. Um, Ramzan, Kadir, excuse me, Ramzan Kadyrov, who is the head of the Chechen Republic, has referred to um, what they've done as an effort to cleanse the blood of the people of Chechnya. Um, so, but at the same time, um, the it, efforts to hold him and and others who uh, perpetrated the acts um, have gone have have not gone anywhere because there's a general denial that any of this has even existed. Um, Ramzan Kadyrov likes to say that there are no gay people in Chechnya, so this couldn't happen. Um, the filmmaker David France uh, made the decision that in, to tell this story that he would focus on the activists who are working to get um, the people who are at risk out of Chechnya, um, because that right now is the solution, is to get people out um, and to get them visas so that they can go to other countries where they may be able to uh, live their lives um, uh, safely. So, um, so if you could show the trailer, um, that'd be great. Thanks. Скажи, пожалуйста, насколько критична ситуация? Дело в том, что мой дядя узнал про мою ориентацию вот недавно. Угу. Он в любом случае меня убьет. А, не мой привет. Мы начали получать первые сообщения из Чечни о том, что в Чечне происходит массовое задержание геев. Мы можем поехать в поедет с нами чувак, доедет до какой-нибудь с нами станции, как только я вышел с метро, или закрылись, и больше ты в России не был. I wanted to ask you about the alleged abduction and torture of gay men in the Republic. Это ерунда. У нас таких людей нету. Практически сразу было решение принято о том, чтобы людей спасать, эвакуировать. У нас не было такого опыта, нужно же людей скрывать, нужно их искать им визы, какие-то пути, тайные, вывоза из страны. Бегом, бегом, бегом. Ох, все, у меня, короче, паника начинается. Разворачивайте, кто вы выглядите? 
не будут искать. Я это прекрасно все знаю. Я не буду делать все, чтобы это никогда не всплыло. Изменить ситуацию может только человек, который прошел эти пытки, и заявит об этом публично. Не буду делать всевозможные действия, чтобы заткнуть меня. Fantastic, very powerful, and I think touching on a theme which is very pertinent in many African countries where um, homosexuality is still actually um, a criminal offense. So mm -hmm. I think that we'll have a lot of interest in talking to that film and mm -hmm. certainly look forward to seeing it here. Mm -hmm. um, we're going we're gonna to pause there with Welcome to Chechnya and introduce the next film, Kushburanka. Would you like to speak about An Insignificant Man? Um, yes. So uh, in around 2012, uh, India was seeing anti-corruption protests like um, uh, similar protests that were happening all around the world, including uh, Occupy Wall Street and the anti-austerity protests in Europe. And for us, the anti-corruption protests took, uh, took place at a scale which was unprecedented until then um, uh, since our independence movement. And um, with the fervor around the protests, there was this lack of w what is the way ahead. And so as they started tapering out, uh, a faction of the protesters decided to make a political party to, to uh, pitch for change from within the system. Um, and when they created this political party, um, we had been traveling around the world and witnessing these protests. We came back to India and uh, decided that we wanted to follow this story to see where it goes. And so we followed uh, this insurgent party for a year, which was going to fight elections at the local level in Delhi, which is the capital of India. And uh, we, while following their campaign for a year, at the end of the year, uh, the elections took place and um, we you know, saw the culmination of the story uh, in them winning the elections in a very surprising way. Um, and uh that that this kind of a political documentary shot in a verite style uh was uh, uh the first of its kind in india and um yeah you know more if you can see the trailer um okay just before you play the trailer michael i just want to say i'm going to leave the room very briefly as the host um i'm apologizing my computer's hanging which is making me a little bit nervous for going forward and I'm going to jump straight back in so I'm just going to exit while the trailer's on and you'll see me back. Namaskar. Mera naam Arvind Kejriwal hai. जिन लोगों को ये लगता है कि आम आदमी पार्टी को सरकार नहीं बनानी चाहिए, वो जरा हाथ खड़ा कर दें। We say we are not interested in politics, we are only interested in anti-corruption movement. We entered politics. What is his status? अभी नहीं है, अभी आप बिल्कुल नीट एंड क्लीन हो। बाद में भी नीट एंड क्लीन रहेंगे। ये वक्त बताएगा। स्वराज है चर्चा सब की चर्चा मेरी भी तो चलनी चाहिए ना थोड़ी बहुत इसका मतलब यू वुड लुक लाइक चीक्स इन लाइफ अरविंद केजरीवाल तो हैज अ रेप्यूटेशन ऑफ बीइंग एक्सट्रीमली इंटॉलरेंट ऑफ अदर पीपल्स व्हाट्स गोइंग ऑन यू केंद्र यादव वी थॉट दिस इज अ पार्टी विद अ डिफरेंस योर कैंडिडेट्स फॉर डिफरेंट दिस इज रियली लो लेवल आम आदमी पार्टी इज द मोस्ट करप्ट पार्टी वी हैड लॉट ऑफ होप फ्रॉम देम बट नाउ पीपल शुड क्रैश देम जिन लोगों को लगता है सरकार बननी चाहिए जरा हाथ खड़े कर दें और 
Kelvin has energy. He has out-of-box thinking. He has the ability to cut through various things and to come to the core. I want to ask you, ये शासन किसने बनाया है? किसके लिए बनाया है? इन नेताओं के लिए बनाया है? इन बिजली कंपनियों के लिए बनाया है? हमारे लिए शासन है। Okay, let's then turn to the big question we are posing. Can Kejriwal really succeed as a politician? So just to just to recap, Kush I showed that film to a group of activists about a year ago, and at the end of the screening, one of the one of the leaders came to me and said, this changes everything. Um, and I said, okay. And about two weeks ago, he told me he's going to be running in the local elections next year. So um, I think it did. And I think the form has incredible power to shift the thinking of, of activists, not to say that all activists need to become politician. We need activists, but I think it's, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, Thank you. Holly. Can we can we hear about the opposition? Yes. So uh, my story also begins in 2012. Um, that was the year that I went to Papua New Guinea for the second time. And on my second day there, I'd actually gained access to the leader of the opposition of the country in the middle of a political coup. So it was a very um, crazy time, but I think that I arrived a little bit too late for that story. So what ended up happening was on the second day that I uh, was there, the woman that I went to stay with, her name was Dame Carol Kidu. She was the leader of the opposition at the time. She got a call from a community within her electorate that said, the police are here, they're bulldozing our houses and can you please come? And she looked at me with a camera and she said, do you wanna go? and check this out, we have to stop them. So I said, of course. So that day we went down and we found hundreds of policemen, uh, four bulldozers destroying a community of 3000 people. It was much bigger than I anticipated and much bigger than I thought. And I captured the whole thing on camera, including the police opening fire on the community. Uh, so that took, everyone by surprise and then started what would be a, a seven year journey to make the opposition documentary. Um, I then realized that the community leader, Joe Moses needed to be the main character of the film and that I needed to follow um, the Parga Hill community. That's what it's called. That the piece of land that they're on is, is called Parga Hill. And the reason the police were there bulldozing the houses was because an Australian run hotel company wanted the land to build uh, millions of dollars worth of um, hotels, apartments, um, presidential suites, you know, the works. Uh, so if you uh, play the trailer, you, you'll be able to see a little bit of the community. We have our church here. We have our school there. And this is the fourth generation. And this is home. This is what we are fighting for. The top section of Parker Hill is being developed into a world-class tourist attraction. Two major hotels, about 800 apartments. The company just wants to remove the people of their land. displaced residents were now living under canvases and in tents where their homes used to be. We will fight, not with blood. We will fight with our brain. We are not lawyers by profession. We put our case on the internet and that's where we started having this uh, international community coming in to help us. I began to find these fragments of information. The police had no right to demolish any properties there. 
date, we're now 50-50 partners in this project. They've been following me and uh, they've been monitoring my movements. The community, they are very scared. There are people within the government ranks that are manipulating the system. I don't think Joe was aware of what he was actually fighting against. So now, at last fight, believe me, Supreme Court, do or die. You cannot just go treating human beings like animals. All we are fighting for is for them to do what is right, that's all. Fantastic. So now we've all got an overview of the three very diverse stories we're going to be talking about. And I'm going to jump straight in um, with Alison, who's going to take us through the process of developing a campaign for Welcome to Chechnya and, mm -hmm. and sharing her experiences in that regard. Uh, and, and are you able to help me with my slides or is that Liani going to do that or? Um, or my uh, yes, I, I am. Just give me you one more. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, so, um, what I wanted to talk to you about was uh, were three things: um, principles, um, the process, and our goals. And I did that because I uh, my feeling is that um, uh, that these were it was a way for this to be in some way universal. Um, what's different? Uh, my my experience that's different from um, um, Kushbu and Holly is that I am not the filmmaker. I work in partnership with the filmmaker, um, and so um, I, I I commend them for um, being able to both make the film and then actually make their film um, have an impact. So, um, but I work in partnership with the filmmaker. So um, so we can go ahead and and look at the the list of principles, um, Liani, if you if you want to go to the next slide. Um, the, um, the, essentially the idea is that these, these are applicable regardless of the project that we're working on. Um, and essentially the number one thing that we always want to remember is that people need to see the film. Um, you know, the, the, it, what it, impact, impact producing is not marketing. There are a lot of people that want to, um, think that it's marketing. It's not marketing. Um, but, at, but we share a, a goal with those who are marketing a film, which is that we need people to actually see the film. Um, in this case, as I talk more about it, it's, it, it's, it, it, it actually becomes part of what we're, you know, it, it's core to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, another thing to remember, um, and this is applicable, I think, in terms of all types of activism and advocacy, is that you need to acknowledge that work has been was being done before you came along. Um, this is not uh, you don't need to come along. You don't need to come in and and create your own thing. Um, what you need to do is to pay attention to the folks who. Um, who've been doing the work um, and take their lead um, and understand um, what, uh, take the time to really understand what it is that, that, um, that they uh, have been doing um, and, and, and don't cannibalize their resources, which literally means don't compete with organizations that are doing this work for, the re for resources to do your campaign. Um, relatedly, it's, you know, we're, we're not um, interested in um, uh, recreating the wheel. Um, you know, one of the things that we we do is instead of coming up with our own you know regular calls to action we really think about how do we amplify because we're we're reaching audiences how can we amplify the calls to action of the partners that we're working with um, instead um, we also uh, aim to compensate partners for their work um, either directly or indirectly in the case of welcome to Chechnya. Um, we did receive some funding that enabled us to provide small subgrants to allow some of the organizations that we work with to be able to um, cover staff time, any staff time that they put towards um, their work um, with us. Um, but we also um, uh, have um, raised money for um, uh, for the groups that um, uh, we have used screenings to raise money for um, uh, the um, uh, activists portrayed in the film. Um, and we could talk a little bit more about that and, and about why that's the case. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. 
um, uh, uh, being open to new opportunities, but staying focused on the, the impact goals. Um, in the case of Welcome to Chechnya, we're gonna talk a little bit about the four goals that we decided to focus on. Um, uh, and, and we have you know, committed to staying um, on target. Um, but in the, in the process of the film um, being out in the world, um, there was actually something that happened organically. Um, the filmmaker, in order to make the film, the film, um, the filmmaker needed to uh, work with a uh, visual effects um, uh, a man by the name of Ryan Laney um, in order to figure out a way to obscure people's identities because they could not participate in making the film and expose who they really are. Um, but they, uh, the filmmaker wanted to, excuse me, I'm speaking about David France. David did not want to do a lot of what people have done traditionally to obscure identities, which is to like do shadows, put people in the dark, use animation to cover faces, that kind of thing. Because what he really wanted to accomplish was something which would enable, um, uh, um, uh, which would enable the audience to um, experience empathy um, with the characters. Um, and so there was actually research, they worked with researchers at, at Dartmouth University in the United States, um, to, excuse me, Dartmouth College in the United States to, um, to develop this, this, this solution in partnership with this visual effects director. But, what happened in the process of making this film is that um, the the man who 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 developed this visual effects strategy is now working with human using that to work with human rights organizations to be able to help them to obscure the identities of those they're trying to work with and and activists as well. So it's actually having this interesting additional impact beyond what we originally expected. Um, can I just interrupt yeah. you there briefly, yeah. Alison? I just want to draw the, the participants' attention to this absolutely revolutionary work that this film did. Um, I mean, I was absolutely blown away because David showed us and he, and, he, and he actually showed us the process. So what he did is animate other people's faces onto the faces of the main characters in the film so as to obscure the identity. And I just want that to kind of sink in because I think that's really change the way we can protect people's identities yeah. um, in these kinds of films. So very remarkable. Yeah, what, what, it, what it does is that it's literally takes my face and kind of places it on, on someone else's face, but it doesn't mean it, they look like me because it sort of adopts the features yeah. of the, but what's, what's actually also interesting about the process was that the people who essentially lent their faces are young, um, LGBT activists in the United States who did so as a way to sort of uh, provide the opportunity for these stories to be told, like without the co contribution of their faces, um, these you know people could. Um, and 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 the reason you need to obscure people's identities is that in addition to people being in danger in Chechnya, um, because of the history of Chechnya and and wars, there there's a really large diaspora. People have left Chechnya. Have, have, traveled and, and their communities of Chechens that live elsewhere. Um, and so um, people are not necessarily completely safe once they leave Chechnya, they could be in danger in, in their new um, country. And so it, we, we have to make sure that no one can be identified at all. So um, that was a big part of it. So yeah, it was like, a, it's, it's, it's pretty mind blowing and, it's, um, um, and it, it, it turned out to be something that we didn't anticipate having such a potential uh, social uh, policy impact as well. Um, the second one about raising awareness is not enough to, uh, is not, that's not, a lot of people talk about, you make a documentary, so you wanna raise awareness about an issue, but if you end that awareness, but you don't explain to people, you know, what they could actually do, you know, who actually are the decision makers, what are the policies that are creating the problem, then they're not gonna be able to have an impact. So we really think about, well, what are, in, in addition to making someone aware of what's happening in Chechnya, we need to capture the energy that they're experiencing as a as an audience and figure out how to point them in the direction of something meaningful. And, and often that's along a spectrum of, of, of things that they can do based on, you know, who they are, what their values are, what their, you know, desire for, a you know, desire for action is. Um, and so that's, I, I believe that's reflected in the goals. Um, the last one here is about being realistic about what you can achieve. When, and I, I'm gonna talk about process in a moment, but 
what what we heard from people as we were trying to figure out, well, what can this film accomplish? They, you know, they kept saying, don't, don't think you're going to change Ramzan Kadyrov's mind. Like you're not going to, or you're not going to get Vladimir Putin to suddenly hold him accountable because there's, there are too many complicating factors, which uh, in regard to their relationship, in regard to power. And um, so really what we, but what we can do is we can help the organizations that are working to get people out of Chechnya. We have the ability and audiences have the ability to, uh, to, to, um, to participate and contribute in a meaningful way. Um, so, you know, we, we while we want to change what's happening, what can we accomplish? You know, maybe how can we chip away at that? But in the meantime, how can we also contribute to something that's that's going to be life changing for lots of people, um, including people that were generous enough to work with uh, with David to make the film. So. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the process that we undertake um, and you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, the, the, uh, is, I don't, can we go to the next slide? Is okay. it? Go in the other direction. No. Oh, sorry, I skipped one, I'm terribly sorry. Go to the right. No, you're going, you're going the wrong direction. Next that was the next, that is the next one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So to uh, the process that we, um, that we undertake, undertook with this film in particular is that we, you know, we, we, because we, again, we're not the filmmakers ourselves, we have to kind of come along and get caught up um, and understand the issue. And so we met with the team, really figured out what they understood already and and started to understand the relationships that they had built in order to um, to make the film because we knew those were going to be the starting point for the conversations that we needed to have to have. Um, we began watching rough cuts of the film. This we the film came out in January. It premiered at Sundance in January of 2020. We started working with the filmmakers in December of 2018. So we'd already been working for a year. Um, uh, so you know we saw very early cuts of the film, um, but. Essentially, and this is this again is applicable across, uh, the, you know, regardless of the film you're working on, is that the unique way that the story is being told is going to impact the campaign that you do. Um, for example, David's David Francis' decision to tell the story of what was going on through the story of the activists um, was was going to shape how we how we. Um, told the story and also his decision to uh, put one of the victims at the center of the story um, and really allow the audience to build an empathetic relationship with him. Um, also, we knew that people were going to come out of the, the film very um, uh, feeling like wanting to help him as an individual. Um, and so we needed, we knew that we need to have a call to action, which would be about helping this person. Well, while that may not be big systemic change, we knew that that was gonna be a response and we didn't wanna, we didn't wanna miss out on that and, 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 and not acknowledge it and not give people an opportunity to do something. So next slide. So we um, uh, then, uh, after having a clear sense of the film, having obviously understood what the filmmakers' goals were, um, we started to conduct interviews with experts. And this meant everybody, this included like the activists that were actually working on the ground in Russia. This included people who were working on advocacy on the issue um, within Russia, within uh, in Europe, um, and in the US government and the Canadian government. We, we just started to get an understanding of the the national, multilateral, the, all of the different groups, and and essentially trying to get to get from them, well, what? How would you use this film as a as a potential asset um, for your work? Um, I got to keep going. Okay, so uh, so we read reports in the international NGOs. Um, the the primary thing we were we were we uh, we got a sense of as we looked to see what kind of international media coverage there was, is that there wasn't any, um, or there wasn't enough. And so that we, this was a, that, that we needed to contribute to creating a, a greater international outcry. Um, and then we looked at, because I believe that impact um, producing is a lot about, is primarily about strategic partnerships. We, we research our potential uh, partner organizations to really understand their capacity to contribute and to understand where their strengths and weaknesses were so we could leverage their strengths and they could contribute in a meaningful way. Okay, 
we'll go ahead to the next slide, which is the goals. And if you click on the goals, it'll bring you to the um, take, uh, take action page on the website. Okay, sorry. Um, it's not, it's not working. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll let you know what the goals are. I, I don't, it's, it's a live link, so it should go. Um, the, the, the number one thing that we decided to do, the first goal was to, um, to uh, support the groups that were doing the work to get people out of the country. So that meant that means everything from literally giving, raising money for them through audiences, um, but also to, to work uh, to get them, um, uh, to work to get them um, a platform so they could, they could reach decision makers. So for example, we've gotten them audiences at the, um, in the, the British parliament, at the UN LGBT core group, um, at the Canadian embassy in the United States, um, at the, uh, the um, uh, group of, there we go. Um, this is our webpage. If you wanna check it out, <laughs> you can go into more detail. Um, the second one is about amplifying the international outcry, getting people to, uh, the fact that people are denying that this is even happening. If we can, by having more people see the film, and, and speak up about it, that potentially could contribute to getting people to actually be acknowledged that this is happening. Um, that's tied to goal number three, which is about holding the perpetrators accountable. Um, and then the last one, which alludes to something that Mickey said in the beginning of the, the, the piece, is we really want people to understand the global context for what's happening in Chechnya. It, there are in 71 countries around the world, it is uh, considered to be a crime to uh, engage in same sex relations. Um, in six of those countries, the penalty is could be death. Um, and so uh, we want people to understand what is happening around the world and that what is happening in Chechnya is not isolated. Um, and as we've um, brought the film out into the world, um, the, the reality is, is that it's a growth in, in authoritarianism around the globe. There's also a growth in efforts to, um, to uh, uh, people's lives are being ruined because they're gay around the world. And it's, it's, you're seeing it more and more that people who are authoritarian types like to control people. And one of the ways that they do that is to stifle them based on their sexuality. So um, I apologize that I went so long on that, but, um, but I, I invite you to take the time because it, when, within each of these four goals, we go into depth about what are some of the activities that people, audience members can take to participate. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry that our time is so limited because I felt like I, I was making notes. I have so many questions for you and I'm seeing questions popping up in the chat. Right, I'm going good. to hold on to them. I'm going to hold on to them just so that we have an opportunity to hear all three the case studies. And just okay. um, because we can't get to everything in, in the session, I am going to just remind people to look in the chat. T Takira is... Um, just, it's my timer. Takira is posting links in the chat. So if you want to find out more, go into more detail about what Alison is, has just touched on, please do collect those links and paste them onto your desktops and, and follow up after the session. And without further delay, I'm going to invite Kushbu to speak about an insignificant man. Um, thanks, Kushbu. Luckily, I'm not going to be distracted by a screen share here. So I'm just going to hand over to you. And please don't take offense when I show you my two minutes. It's just to make sure that we can fit everybody. Very upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> I hate doing that. Welcome, Kushbu. Can we unmute Kushbu? Um, Tobo? Tobo, Michael? Yeah, thank you. Here we thank go. you. Yeah. Um, so, um, the, uh, I, I should give some context to the documentary landscape in India before we get into, uh, you know, what impact, uh, what an impact campaign means, uh, uh, running an impact campaign means. Um, so, uh, it, the, the, it, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to make political films in India, whether fiction or non-fiction. Uh, you get buried under a lot of legal issues, cases like defamation, there are bans on film censorship, and even potential violence. Uh, 
um, from Prince Group. Um, and uh, this is this is extremely concerning because it in in one way or another it really um, contracts the space for the kind of stories that can be told. Uh, and it wouldn't be a stretch to say that freedom of expression is a very precarious right uh, uh, here. Um, and all of this, uh, you know, so you, as, as a filmmaker, as an independent filmmaker, as an independent documentary filmmaker, all of this is already very, very intimidating. And then uh, it is exacerbated by a complete lack of financial resources. We don't have grants uh, from within India. And um, even though uh, things are changing a little bit, uh, um, th th there's barely any infrastructure or resources that are available to documentary filmmakers. Uh, when we started, there were no, not even any production houses that were producing documentary films. So, um, you know, forget an impact producer. We were, you know, looking for a producer for our documentaries. Uh, so uh, this is the context of how, you know, documentaries are made in India. So our film was an impossible film in more ways than one. Um, uh, uh, a film about, you know, a film which looks inside a political party, which goes uh, uh, within the political sort of um, a wilderness to look at how politics is done had never been made in India. Uh, and uh, when when we started, uh, the Aam Admi Party, which are the which is the the party that we are following, was just starting out as an upstart political insurgent, and they didn't. I mean, nobody had much hope for success uh, from them. They themselves didn't think, you know, that far ahead. Uh, and this was the reason that we managed to get really incredible access into that organization, which became the first sort of thing which, you know, which was a sort of novel, novelty uh, uh, value that for, for the film. Um, when we finished shooting the film, the first thing that we uh, uh, realized was that we were completely out of terms and we were just getting into post-production. So we needed to, we needed to think outside the box in terms of fundraising. And that's when we decided to a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, again, there's no, at this point, there is no platform in India to help run such a campaign. And we, we wanted to run it primarily in India. So Kickstarter was not really an option. Uh, anyway, we decided to cut a trailer and have our own platform where we were going to raise these funds. Um, uh, when we were doing this, the idea of crowdfunding was seen more as an eccentric sort of a thing because, you know, there's like I said, there are no grants available in India. And gen generally, people don't look at films as a sort of charity that they want to give to. So it was, we were up against huge odds. Um, so in any case, we cut a trailer and we released the campaign with a very modest demand of $20,000. And uh, in, unbelievably, it started going extremely viral. And one of the reasons was that such a film had not been seen before, where you were seeing politicians that you knew on the screen doing things, you know, running campaigns, and and people were really uh, uh, seduced by by this kind of a uh, you know insider look into how politics that that runs their lives is actually run by politicians. Um, the campaign did really well. We managed to raise five times the original amount that we had asked for. And we didn't know it then, but this was a huge part of what one would call an impact campaign, even though the film had not finished yet. Uh, the crowdfunding campaign became this, uh, you know, meeting point for stakeholders of the film. The people who, who were our crowdfunders, who gave as little as a dollar for the film, became, became invested in the success of the film. And... Um, while making the film, after the film was finished, uh, at different junctures, they they were there when we needed them. So uh, this sort of a mobilization of a community of people who are invested in your film was a big part of what was to later become uh, uh, our uh, 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 impact campaign, even though we didn't know that's what it's called at that point. Uh, like Alison was saying, our main concern was to just get people to watch the film and, you know, to watch the film for the right reason. Um, 
so after we finished our uh, after we finished making the film the first thing that we did was to uh, try to get international support at this point we were already anticipating trouble from you know legal trouble censorship trouble uh, and we knew that having international support would give credibility to our film would make it harder for for uh, the establishment to uh, to stop the release of the film uh, our film premiered at the toronto international film festival and it went on to play at over 60 international film festivals uh, we also got a lot of prestigious grants like uh, the ifa bertha fund doc society journalism fund um, the sandan fund asian cinema fund uh, and many others um and this lent artistic credibility and narrative credibility to the film because it's a political film everybody was going to you know want to say that oh it's a partisan film but having this kind of uh, uh, um prestigious support on board gave us a you know opportunity to say no this is a complex story which has many different you know sides of narrative um Gonna, After our, yeah, I'm just going to pause you there, Kushbu, because there's quite a few questions jumping into the chat. People are asking okay. how you raised how you raised funding that in Nigeria, with the suppression of the Stop SARS protest in in Nigeria, which happened just in yeah. the last two weeks. People yeah. are relating very strongly to the story, so I just want to draw everybody's attention to the link we've just posted in the chat, where you can watch uh, Kushbu's. impact film so please take that link and and watch it after the session and she explain they explain quite comprehensively there how they raised funds for the film over to you yeah. kushfu yes um i i should just say funding is something that you guys are looking at especially a uh, one very interesting source of funding can also be patronage like rich people rich liberal people in your country you know who uh, who you go to and say that look this is something that this is a story that needs to be told and get a a large sum of money for from them and we did that too and it worked so that is something maybe to consider as well um the the once once our international uh, campaign was done and you know it was seen as quite successful uh the time came for the film to release in india and this was extremely you know uh, we were very very apprehensive about this entire uh process uh and just as we had expected um we faced huge uh, censorship troubles uh so given the context of the censor board in india one has to understand that it's not uh it's not a judicial organization it can it its decisions can be very very arbitrary and partisan which means that it can it's it's really an instrument to not uh, uh, not allow uncomfortable ideas or alternative narratives to go out they can create real uh, uh, you know grievances for filmmakers uh, uh, without any legal basis and this is really i mean i i i'll tell you how this manifested for us they watched the film and then they came out saying that you cannot use names of political leaders and political parties including the prime minister of the country without their permission now one can extrapolate what that means it means that you cannot make a documentary about polit political parties or politicians without their permission how can any critique of politics happen without uh, uh, you know if you have to ask for the permission of people you are critiquing so um this this you know it it was a very very serious obstacle not just for us but even for future filmmakers who want who would want to make films like that um the we started framing this issue in the media wherein we were like this is a this is a really really uh, of great concern that films can't be made about politics and politicians and who are they to give us permission they should ask our permission before Do, you know doing their jobs uh, not the other way around and this really resonated with with uh, uh, people and the media and uh, uh, the story became really really big and so in an ironical way this censorship issue actually gave us more exposure and visibility and that is again something that i would would say that if there are censorship issues in your country to use it for yourself you know to to turn it around and create like a uh, a uh, uh, 
a campaign where it becomes where it really appeals to the audience's uh, 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 sense of righteousness. Um, after we managed to, so we managed to win our censorship battle, and there was a precedent setting judgment which said, which which means that filmmakers will be able to make such films use the names of politicians and political parties, which was great. Um, once that happened, we released the film uh, in theaters. We did a guerrilla campaign on a very very small budget, and again, you can see the campaign film. We explain it in quite a lot of detail. Uh, I'm short on time, so I'll just quickly go through some of the things that we did. We um, made uh, interesting videos about ideas of democracy, ideas in the film, ideas about politics. We, uh, as a conscious strategy, we approached the uh, political media to write about our film and talk about our film, as opposed to the Bollywood or the film media. uh we uh, reframed the idea that the film was a documentary because everybody had this idea that documentaries are boring in india because there is a there is a public service you know a, a, a burden on it and we started calling it non fiction political thriller and uh, things like that so we did a lot of uh, uh, out of the box thinking around uh, to convince people and uh, the film ended up uh, doing really well it ran for 8 weeks in cinemas and became the highest grossing grossing political documentary uh and we used the momentum towards a digital release so while it was still in theaters we released the film on youtube uh, where in it ended up being watched over 2.5 million times um uh and uh, uh, you know like mickey was saying we keep, it was watched by people all over the world uh we keep getting messages from politicians upcoming politicians around the world who say that we watched your film and we you know got ideas and we you know got inspiration from it which is incredible that it has increased political participation by newer politicians around the world and that that would be its biggest impact um thank you thank you kushbu thank you very much i think that's very inspiring i love the non fiction political thriller i think that many of the nollywood filmmakers sitting in the room would relate to that and i think you managed to find a solution to making <laughs> documentary sound sexy so well done for that and i do encourage everyone to watch that impact film and find out more about this project jumping and the Str film is on youtube if anyone wants to watch it Absolutely. Thank you. We've posted those links. Holly, over to the op the opposition. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll just screen share my screen with you. So, um the opposition um we actually started our impact campaign in about 2014. Um this was about halfway through production. um and that was because we got selected for good pitch australia this was the first time we knew what impact was this is an initiative run by doc society to pitch and to gain partners that aren't traditionally connected with film so it could be educators and lawyers and ngos and anyone who could help you create an impact or an audience with your film so we went through this process and then that's how we um were able to figure out how to design the impact campaign um in which the first step was really figuring out what was the message of the opposition film and we as a team brainstormed this together and came up that the film's message if you were the audience member having just watched the film and the credits started rolling then the message that you would come away with was that there would be a big gap there is a big gap between law and justice in papua new guinea and especially in forced evictions So then it was the idea of okay then what do we want to do about it. And so our impact vision was to ensure that communities at risk of forced eviction were safeguarded and that their human rights were upheld. Uh this was um you know we had amazing amount of plans but then uh something unexpected happened. And one of the characters in the film, the opposition leader that I spoke about earlier that I actually went to Papua New Guinea to meet. Her name was Dame Carol Kidu. At the beginning of the film, she is the leader of the opposition. She fights on the behalf of the community to um, protest the development of the land. And and this is a bit of a spoiler alert for people who haven't seen the film. But by the end of the film, Dame Carol quits politics and starts working for the hotel company, and and helps them move the community off the piece of land. So. 
we had access to her before uh, the filming began, uh, while she was opposition leader, and then uh, the relationship between um, myself as the filmmaker and her started to sour when she quit politics. Um, she actually did give us more interviews after being um, a consultant with the development company. And she was able to tell her side of the story, but, um, but then she decided to sue us in the Supreme Court when we were about two weeks away from our hot docs premiere. Okay. So we then quickly had to go through the court process to figure out how we could um, still screen the film to the public. But temporarily, the judge actually injuncted the footage that she was contesting just so that we could finish the court case. But that meant that we had to redact the opposition film for our Hot Docs premiere. So what we did was literally put this black screen over the film for the um, uh, nine minutes that Dame Carol is in the film, this screen would appear. And then we had a popular actress, Sarah Snook, who would narrate for the audience the, the events within the film that they missed. Um, so it created a bit of a strange film, but what it really was, was a, um, was a, oh, I think I've just stopped sharing. I'm just gonna get that back for you. Um, what that did was um, create a media buzz and what happened was we called it the censored film. And much like Kushbu was saying that because you've got adversity in the film or because you've got someone censoring you, you can actually use it to your advantage. And to, um, I love Kushbu's words, appeal to your audience's sense of righteousness. That's such a beautiful way of putting it because um, that's what we did. We tried to get as much international press on the fact that we were being censored. And what happens in Australia and in Papua New Guinea is the press only reports things that the international community are responding to. So if we made a big splash internationally, then the Australian and Papua New Guinean media would also pick it up. But, other, but if we didn't do a big splash internationally, then the Australians would just think that we're a small human rights film and no one would really care. So what this did was actually create a lot of buzz for us. Um, we then went back to Australia and we were able to work with a team of pro bono lawyers. And this is us on our victory day because we actually won. This was a massive effort and amazing because we'd actually met all of these lawyers before because we were doing the impact campaign and we knew we wanted a team of pro bono lawyers to help us. So the opposition film got legally checked six, seven different times including the US. And these lawyers already knew every single detail, every single second of the film and they legally checked it off. So when later it came time for us to be sued, we then went back to them and said, we need your help, can you please help us? And they said, of course. So they were already up to date and ready to fight on our behalf. And that would never have happened had we not built partnerships around the film to be able to make it as robust and as supported by other people as possible. I think I just want to so, interject there, Holly, and, and say I think what's really brilliant about your campaign was the way that you took that injunction and turned it around and use it as part of the, the impact, you know, the fact that people try to censor you. Um, and I think that that links to what Kushbu was talking about, um, not having funding, not having support for documentary and using the whole crowding campaign again to then feed into the impact campaign. So just drawing everybody's attention to the fact how important it is to think as you're on this journey, taking those, those stumbling blocks and turning them into tools to, mm. to build a campaign. Amazing. Yeah, that's right. So once we actually got the film all together, then we were able to re-premiere the film at IDFA um, and show the film as, as we intended it. Uh, but we also had another massive problem. We couldn't sh share the film any further until we actually helped our main character, Joe Moses. He's the community leader of the Parga Hill community. He sacrificed greatly for his um, human rights work. And at the end of the film, he's actually in hiding. He fears arrest. Um, he has people follow him. And he fears 
um, that he'll have, um, he, he'll be killed in custody if he ever is arrested. So he puts himself into hiding. Only um, myself and two of his community leaders knew where he was and he was calling for help. And we knew we couldn't screen the film any further until we'd actually solved um, Joe's safety problem. So what we did was we went and flew to the International Anti-Corruption Conference in Panama City. We used the film to get us the tickets for Joe and the accommodation. Joe is allowed as a Papua New Guinean man to go to Panama without a visa, which is why we chose that country. And while there, he then met uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders. So this is Joe maybe half an hour after he's landed in the country with the UN Special Rapporteur. At this meeting, Joe then asks for help with his asylum case and the UN representative said, you're now under the UN mandate and we will help you. We're gonna activate our international networks. So that was a, a huge moment for our impact campaign. Again, this wasn't easy to do. Uh, Joe had to have a mil military escort from his hiding place onto the plane. Uh, he then got detained in Singapore for five days. And we had to have all of these lawyers and international NGOs write letters to Singapore airport to be able to release him. And then on he went to Panama where he um, then uh, claimed safety. We then flew Joe on to London uh, where he also, as a Papua New Guinean man, can stay without a visa for six months. Uh, and then we started getting pro bono lawyers around Joe. So this is a very legal, legal impact campaign. So this is Jen Robinson. She acted as a pro bono lawyer on Joe's behalf. Um, she's become famous for representing WikiLeaks, but she's also done a lot of um, legal work in Papua New Guinea and West Papua. So she was really passionate about the issue. And so we did, we got Joe Asylum in the UK for five years. This is Joe's UK ID card. Uh, and now it's been um, three years and Joe's now been invited by um, the British Home Office to be a permanent British resident, um, which would allow dual citizenship. So he can be both British and Papua New Guinean. We then um, didn't have things like accommodation or um, anything for Joe. So what we did was we actually used the festival circuit to be able to help him. So we just basically took Joe on this massive tour around Europe. And this is him at the UN Human Rights Council. Joe did two different presentations to a full room. It was quite amazing because he presented all of the evidence of his case up to the point where the Papua New Guinean representative to the United Nations then stood up in front of the entire room and called Joe a liar. And then Joe presented even more evidence proving that he was not a liar. And this representative had to sit down and Joe got applauded. So that was quite a good moment. At every um, festival, we would have the audience stand up so that Joe could take a photo with the audience. And we would then send that um, photo to the Parker Hill community so that they would know everybody had heard their story that night. And this is Joe in Australia presenting at the Human Rights Festival in Australia. So then on to our um, impact goal in Papua New Guinea, which as you might remember was safeguarding communities at risk of forced eviction. And the Parker Hill community was struggling greatly. So we knew we needed to, to work closely with the Parker Hill community to get their living conditions um, and human rights met and then work with them to help other communities that are in a similar situation. So the Parker Hill community did get evicted. They got evicted to a, a tent camp, which was um, incredibly um, uh, sad. And this is an example of what the one toilet looks like. And this is an example of what the accommodation looks like. As you can see, there's just rows of tents. They're very small and an entire family needs to fit in one. And it's actually um, daylight outside, but because there's a giant roof over it and no lighting, it's basically dark the entire time. So we ran an impact workshop with the Parker Hill community leaders and we asked them what they wanted to do with the film in Papua New Guinea. 
And together we designed this big screening campaign where we'd run outdoor cinemas in PNG. And this is an example of one. We would put up a bed sheet. Uh, we gave them um, projectors and, um, and speakers so that they could tour the film around. After this um, screening or in each screening, the community would then be invited to, um, to take a part in a community meeting where they would discuss what they would do if they also came under threat of eviction as a way of premeditating the strategy so that if it came down to it, they would already have a plan that was agreed on in place. Okay. One of the things that the Parker Hill community wanted to do was to, to mark the anniversary of six years since the first demolition which actually occurred on Mother's Day. So this protest is led by the mothers of the Parker Hill community. They're wearing white. And it's actually against the governor of the city and his anti-corruption walk, which they thought was hypocritical. And his, his um, walkers are wearing red. So this is a shot of one of the Parker Hill community mothers putting a traditional bill and bag around the governor of the city and inside the, the bill and bag is a copy of the opposition DVD. We had three different camera crews and we had a drone in the air so that you could see the clash of the red protesters and the, the red t-shirt wearers. And that was played on the 6 p.m. news that night. Holly, I'm, I'm gonna have to stop you there. I hate doing it, but we no, are- No, that's okay. This is actually the last one. I, I, this I, is I the Go for it. So this is just a, a slide of Alan and his mother and they were the ones that organized that protest. So it's a big thank you to Alan. That's me done. Thank you. Thank you to Alison, Holly and Kushbu. I think we could, we could easily carry on for another half an hour to bring this session to completion, but we have run out of time. I want to pose, I've, I've res we've responded to most of the questions in the chat, but I want to pose a final closing question to each of you. What, what really strikes you, and I'm gonna start with Holly, is the kind of determination and the constant effort that an impact campaign requires. So maybe if you can just close with a comment on that, about that commitment and about what, what is it that keeps you going and what you have to keep in the back of your head. And I'd like each of you to, to end with that as a closing statement, please. Um, I think that's, that's interesting. One thing about the opposition to me was, it wasn't about motivation. Um, it was about an obligation. From the very first time that I filmed the community and the police opening fire on them, that meant we were linked in a way. Uh, we were friends and we were um, on, a, on a journey together um, that we, you couldn't separate us. So uh, whatever happened, we were together. And that meant that I had an obligation to follow that through. So as things got hard and they very were, they, they were constantly, it was the obligation for each other that got us through. So it's not really about motivation at that point. You just do what you have to do. Amazing. Kushbu. Kushbu's muted. Uh, I completely agree with uh, what Holly just said to, you know, about motivation. Um, uh, additionally, for us, it was also just the fact that, you know, we, we didn't even think of or about it as an impact campaign or, you know, about it in a very, very sophisticated way. Uh, what we realized was that we needed to get from point A to the to point B in that we wanted as many people as possible to watch the film. And we also realized that we would have to make the road for that journey as well, uh, given the complete lack of infrastructure for such a thing in India. And so it was just waking up every day and going to, going to work really uh, more than anything else. Um, Alice, you, still, you still have the big journey ahead. Yeah, we still have a lot, a lot of uh, land to cover, but I, I think part of it is the is realizing that you have the capacity to to help. Um, you know, you see opportunities. So as each opportunity, I mean, the film is presenting opportunities that we believe you know are valuable to the people that we're trying to to support. And so it's just it. it I 
I can help, so I'm going to. Um, and then, and then otherwise, it's it goes back to the fact that these are stories. I mean, I am also an audience member, and I was compelled by people's stories, and I now want to do something for them because I, you know, a, a story was told to me, and that now I want to act. So, you know, I'm just, I just stand, I'm just standing for another audience member in that way. So, fantastic. Thank, you. thank you, Alison. Thank you to our fantastic panelists from the US, from Australia, from India, to all our participants from around the world, to Afif and to UCT for hosting this session. And I think it was fantastic. And I hope that we will reconnect. And I hope that most of the participants will stick around for the next session. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Bye.